there was a strange conversation about what does the UK pay to the European collaboration and what does the UK take from European collaboration in terms of finance. But no one actually talked about what is the gain of European collaboration. I think that's your topic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Well, I, I am I'm speaking just after Alistair Kent uh, and his eloquence. I mean, somebody who could actually meet with Watson and Crick in a pub and talk about something other than beer, unlike me. And I'm the last obstacle between this audience and, and, and coffee break. So I will take this as an invitation to brevity as opposed to a death trap, which is uh, what others might look at it. But I, I still would like to say a few words, hopefully to convince you of how much it is an extraordinary privilege for a bureaucrat, or if I, if, if I may, a civil servant like me, or my colleagues, Jarek and, and Enrico, who will be speaking later on, how much it is a privilege to be invited to this community of committed people who are actually game changers on something so important for Europe and for the human condition. Now, it's hard to imagine a better place to hold a conference like this in, than in Edinburgh, because, you know, Scotland, Edinburgh, gave us the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, I'm not sure about Athens and, and, and Edinburgh, but they did give us the Scottish Enlightenment. Somebody like David Hume, who, who uh, joined the University of Edinburgh at the age of 12, uh, was somebody who actually convinced us of the power of science, of knowledge, of the mind to change, to improve the human condition. And I'm sure that if he was here today, he would be astonished and convinced that one of the best examples of what science, what knowledge can do to improve human condition is what is the agenda, what is what this community of rare diseases patients, organizations have been doing. So my first words are of thanks to, to Minister Maureen Watt for uh, hosting this conference on behalf of the Scottish Government. I want to thank to Telkel, Telkel, not just because of how much error this does for, to help us in our groups, to help us in, in our committees in the Brussels bubble, but much more so for how much you're doing with error this to make sure that the voice of the patients is heard. Not just heard in terms of advocacy, but heard because of what patients have to contribute to the very agenda, to the very substance of fighting against rare diseases. And indeed to Tamara Kohler and DIA, and indeed to Alistair Kent, again, not just for his eloquence, not just for what he has done for genetics and a better understanding of the genetics of rare diseases, but for what he's doing for, and I cannot describe it as anything more than the brilliant advocacy of what patients have to contribute to actually drive the agenda of rare diseases. So again, thank you. And, and let me devote a few words to tell you about, if I may, what is the role of health in the agenda of the European Commission and what is the role of rare diseases in that agenda. Now, you know that Europe is in a really, really dramatic condition. I, I've been working, I mean, I am very new to the world of health. It's still, I'm still astonished at how much I have to learn. But I am no spring chicken, speaking of uh, chicken and poultry uh, in classical Greece. I've been in the Commission for a long time, since my country, Spain, joined the EU, actually. And I have never seen what we're seeing today, which is that the very basic principles that we thought were guaranteed and stable, free movement of people, the internal market, a solidarity, actually the very basic principles of democracy now seem to be in question. So this is for the Commission, I can tell you, for the current European Commission, an extraordinary incentive to do differently from what we've done in the past and focus exclusively on a number of very important issues, but not just that, a number of very important issues where the EU can do something about, meaning where European countries, European citizens cannot do by themselves. Now, if you look at it from that perspective, is health important enough for Europe, for the Commission to work on it? And what about rare diseases there? To me, it's very simple, and I will give you one image that stuck to me when I arrived in my new job as the perfect image of what health means for Europe. And this is something, it's a study conducted by the UCL, the University College London, about actually the London tube, the London subway. 
they show with evidence that if you take the Jubilee Line at Westminster and travel eastwards, at every stop of the London subway, life expectancy decreases by one year. This means that if you are a 40-year-old woman in good health and you are in Oxford Circus, your life expectancy today is 98 years. That same woman with the misfortune of being born in Bow Church, a few miles further, would have a life expectancy of 76 years. Now, 20 odd years of life expectancy is a big price to pay for inequality. And this tells us how impossible it is for Europe to do anything that is worthwhile about the future of Europe, about the sustainability of our healthcare systems, about the essence of our welfare regimes which distinguish us from other parts of the world. That's why so many people want to come to Europe. Well, it is impossible to do something about that if we're not looking at the access, effectiveness, resilience of our healthcare systems. And if we look at health as part of our future, so there is no question that health should be part of the European agenda, and the Commission is very conscious of this. But then comes the other critically important question, as I mentioned, which is it's not just that we should identify an important issue. We should identify an issue where we can do something about it. So you can see the difficulty. When somebody asks me or my colleagues, what can Europe do in an area like health, where the EU has no powers, no regulatory powers. We cannot tell countries what to do in the field of health. We cannot tell them how to organize their healthcare systems. So I do have one immediate, clear, compelling answer to the question, what can Europe, what can the Commission, what can my Director General do for health that is clear, tangible, and adds value? It's rare diseases. The European reference networks are the most obvious, brilliant demonstration of what Europe can do, what the EU Commission can do for citizens. Because it is an area where there is a need for critical mass that no country, no organization has. There is a need for interdisciplinary work. There is a need for innovation. And there is a need for incentive. And there is a need for collaboration and participation of citizens. Now, what better definition than this as the mission of Europe, certainly in the field of health. So I hope that this is enough to convince you that if there is one priority that we should maintain in the European Commission, in my department, in only to be able to answer the question, what are you there for? Well, that priority is and will continue to be supporting rare diseases and European reference networks. Alistair Kent uh, put it brilliantly, we are at the cusp of opportunity, but a lot remains to be done. But certainly the first thing to remember, and believe me, I'm sure for most of you who have been working on this for many more years than me, but certainly for somebody who works in an EU institution, there is a shortage of optimistic messages. But certainly this is something that can keep us going, that can keep me going, that can keep my colleagues going, to think of how much opportunity we have if we just try to do with a modest means more in the field of rare diseases in supporting patients, organizations, and countries. This is our agenda for the future, to do more, for example, on codification. Minister Watt mentioned the 30 million uh, people in Europe who are affected by rare diseases. Well, she mentioned that, but she doesn't know the number. Nobody knows the number. That's the problem. We don't know exactly how many people have a rare disease in Europe. We should do more of an effort there because it is only by being clear, by having a stronger, clear, more precise idea that we'll be able to do more about it. So we have to do an effort on that. We have to do an effort on IT tools because the connectivity of collective work of collaboration is essential so that the Commission and others can support patients, organizations, networks, and other stakeholders. So there's a long way to go. But certainly I can guarantee that the focus, the top priority we will have with our modest means for the next four years, after that is science fiction, another political commission will come, another agenda, another Xavier here. But certainly for the duration of this mandate of the commission, I can tell you, ERN will be not just a focus of our priority, but also something that will help us feel not just as bureaucrats, but as civil servants. Now, that has a price. I prefer 
to look at myself when I shave in the morning and say, hello, civil servant, and hello, bureaucrat. But then, of course, I have to deliver, which means that we are there to serve. So my plea to you is don't hesitate if you think the Commission can do more to say so, to ask, to demand, to kick. I can tell you there's many, many people in my daily work that kick and demand and ask things that are far less necessary than what you do. Thank you.